Ladies and gentlemen, from a catacomb buried deep beneath the streets of the New World Order, this is the Remnant Underground. And now, here's your host, Michael J. Mack. Good evening, folks. Happy final week in Advent to you all. Rob, how you doing? I'm doing all right. So. Good, I'm doing fine. You ready for Christmas? It's coming right up. Coming right. Do you do, you do the baby Jesus? It's, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, so do I. Uh-huh. It's interesting, yeah. The old uh, baby Jesus is big in the catacombs. We don't exactly do the Santa Claus so much. We kind of do both a little bit, but right, right, like mostly that. we use the old German tradition of the baby Jesus coming, so all the kids are putting their little straw into the basket and doing all of that all Advent long, preparing for the birth of Jesus. And then, of course, on Christmas Eve night, he, we go into the uh, the family room where we see what the baby Jesus has brought. It's a wonderful, wonderful tradition. If anybody's interested in that old German tradition, it's called Christkind. Uh, we always try to put some information up on our website. If you're looking for something a little bit more theological and still a lot of fun and a beautiful tradition, uh, check that out. Anyway, it's my, my favorite time of year is Christmas. It's here. Got the old Christmas beard going because we're going down into the deep freeze. Right. 15 right. below zero come Christmas Eve. I'm very excited about oh, yeah? that. Yeah, 15 below. I hear about that. Oh, it's fantastic. I always feel like 15 below is just, it kind of gets the evil riffraff out of the way. And, <laughs> you know, only good solid Catholics go out in 15 degree below or certainly enjoy it. I know I know, I do. I think it's fantastic. So, anyway, uh, almost Merry Christmas. Not quite yet. Never Happy Holidays, of course, down here in the catacombs. Unless you pronounce it Happy Holy Days, then that's just fine. Before I forget, thank you so much, all of you out there in catacomb land. Well, I don't know if we can call it quite catacomb land. We'll work on that. But anyway, out there watching us week after week, you responded last week to our plea for some help down here with the little icon that Rob always makes mysteriously appear up there for you to use. Thank you. That makes, that makes all the difference in the world to us. It was a good week. Uh, we got some ideas for uh, how we're going to maybe make, make some, some pretty interesting adjustments to the program coming up in the new season and in the new year. And, of course, we couldn't do that uh, w- without your help. So th- thank you so much because uh, we're hoping we're making a little difference down here and we realize the world certainly seems to be going a little bit more insane every year and, and every day, really, and we're trying to uh, do our little part to offset that. You saw the, the new hipster uh, nativity set, Rob? And this is one. Oh, hipster. The, not the Vatican one. No, not the Vatican one. This is this is the hipster set, and it's just uh, it's all the rage. is flying off the shelves. We've got a little clip, so we'll take a look at that for a second. A new decorative set is putting a very modern spin on the traditional nativity display. It's called the hipster nativity set. It comes complete with wise men on segways, bearing gifts from Amazon Prime, as well as a latte drinking Mary and a man bun sporting Joseph. Oh my. And he's taking a selfie with baby Jesus. Orders for the nativity are through the roof for the maker of modern nativity, who says they sell about 500 sets a day. Yeah, there it is. There it is, Joseph the selfie and the man bun. I mean, holy cow, Rob. Look oh. look out. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not begging for the chastisement, it would seem. And the irony is there are plenty of conservative groups, conservative Catholics, that are really exor- rightfully exorcised over, over this ridiculous, stupid stunt. But ironically enough, still out there defending something which I think is much worse, and that's our... Well, our hipster Pope's nativity display over, over in the Vatican right now, the one that we talked about last week, the one that featured this naked guy. Or I will throw him up on the screen. Now, I just found out today that Veritas VeritasVincientInternational.org attempted to actually use a photo. Get this. They, they attempted to use a photo of the Vatican's nativity scene this year in an advertisement on a Facebook post. But they were rejected by the social media giant because, you guessed it, According to Facebook, according to Facebook, photos of this year's Vatican nativity scene violate their policy against, quote, including images that are sexually suggestive or pr- provocative in a Facebook ad post. What about that, Rob? That's what you want in your Vatican nativity scene. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Facebook now is a little bit more, you know, concerned or conservative than the Vatican. It's just out of control. You really, you really can't make this stuff up. But... That's not what we're here to discuss tonight, a week before the birth of our Savior. We're, we're in a great mood down here. Everything is, uh, is feeling Christmassy and good, and I, I'm not discouraged. I really am not discouraged this Christmas because it seems like there's just so much overreaching now when people are waking up. I mean, I see, I see an awakening taking place in various places, but all around the world that I, ne- I really never expected to see, not in, not in my lifetime. And in my position as a, you know, as an editor of a newspaper, you know, we get we get lots of lots of mail and email and so forth every day. And I talk to people all the time, 
many of whom are not yet traditional Catholics at all. At least they don't, they don't quote unquote identify as one. But they're really angry. They're fed up. They feel like they've been had. And they've managed to keep enough of the faith, despite it all, to want to learn the truth of what's really happened to the Catholic Church over the ha past half century. They know something really, really bad has happened. And they're looking into finding out what it is and seeing if they can go back to the way, to the way it should be, at least in their own lives. So I, I'm seeing something maybe not everyone is seeing. You look at the news, you look at Pope Francis and, and all those shenanigans, and you just think, man, it's over. It's the end. Well, maybe it is. Maybe this is the apocalypse. But i got to tell you, I want to share with you, especially at Christmas time now, um, I'm seeing just a lot of, of hopeful signs. People work waking up all around the world, sort of a worldwide coalition of believers that are starting to take a stand, finally, against the insanity in the state and in the government and, you know, certainly in the Vatican, in this whole rotten regime of novelty that we got from, I'm sorry, but that we got from the stupid Second Vatican Council. I, I, I was just a baby. No, no, I take that back. I wasn't even born when the Second Vatican Council ended. What in heaven's name, what exactly did any of us get from Vatican II? Why are we still talking about this infernal thing 50 years later, this disastrous event? What did we get from it? Other than the silent apostasy that Pope John Paul talked about, the smoke of Satan that even old Paul VI talked about entering the, the sanctuaries of the church, the dictatorship of relativism that Pope Benedict XVI spoke of quite often, and a worldwide loss of Catholic identity, a Protestantized and just plain silly, silly liturgy now. Now, don't get mad at me for saying, oh, it's the Mass, you can't be mean to... No, you know what Pope Benedict the XVI called the, the, uh, the Mass of the Catholic Church today, the post-conciliar Mass? He called it trivialized. He referred to the Mass as a trivialized liturgy since the Second Vatican Council. And then, of course, we have this massive crisis in the, in the priesthood. I, I, you can go down the list. These are the things that we've gotten, that the church has gotten over the past half century, the past 50 years, since the close of, of, of the Second Vatican Council in 1965. And I guess I'm just wondering why it's necessary to still <laughs> defend this silly thing. It's not silly. It's demonic. It's, it's run rough, roughshod over the traditions of our faith. People have left the church. Nuns are becoming practically non-existent the world over. Vocations are down. There's a sex scan. It's a mess. And people say, well, now, after the Second Vatican Council, we get to participate in the liturgy. Participate in the liturgy? First of all, how audacious to think that people were not participating in the liturgy before the Second Vatican Council. If for 1,965 years, Catholics were not participating in the liturgy, and they only found out how to participate in the liturgy in the last 50 years. And why are you even part of this church if it got something as basic and as fundamental as its own liturgy wrong for almost two millennia? And I want to show a little clip of Bill Buckley years ago on Crossfire describing what he saw in the new mass 40, 45 years ago, whenever this was. Uh, so that we can again look at that and say, gee, I wonder if maybe those, the, those initial reactions to the new mass uh, and to the whole revolution that the new mass signaled. If those initial reactions weren't something that we should take really seriously right now, so just for a few moments we're going to show you a clip of Bill Buckley's reaction to the new mass of Pope Paul VI. Take a look. Uh, I think the changes in the world happened before and during and after Vatican II, and to say it's because of the liturgical changes we've had the lack of renewal in the church, I think that's a simplistic answer. Well, it may, it may be simplistic. <coughs> Uh, you, you may reject uh, a causative explanation. On the other hand, uh, certainly that which was held forward as primarily justifying Vatican II didn't happen. Well, it was to be a great unifying, uh, spiritualizing uh, uh, experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in fact, it caused widespread disaffection. I am, I am a practicing Roman Catholic right. who finds attendance at the new mass, an aesthetic ordeal. And so, quite apart from the Vietnam War or Hugh Hefner or anything else, yeah. uh, I find uh, the, uh, the attendance at mass less satisfying than it used to be, in part because uh, I find what's going on uh, in the altar uh, expressing a kind of fascistic concern for me. They don't, don't, won't let me alone for three minutes. Mm -hmm. I got to stand up when I was sitting down. I got to sit down when I was standing up. I got to embrace people. Uh, I got to listen to children who don't know how to keep a tune twanging away at guitars. All that kind of stuff I find distracting. 
I'm just one person reporting one individual's reaction. How do you cope with that? So you like the old liturgy because the, the I was able to pray and you weren't kind of impinged by a priest or other people. That kind of notion, the old liturgy gave you a sense of uh, well, it, it, it gave me it gave me a sense that the priest was there as a mediator between me and God, yeah. uh, whereas it seems to me that the existing approach tends to be sort of crowd oriented. Yeah. That's well said. I, I just can't help but think that there were a lot of people in Bill Buckley's camp back in those days. Obviously, this is a man who's a traditional Catholic. If you watch that entire debate, you can see because Michael Davies is on that debate and Malachi Martin two former uh, remnant columnists, by the way. And you can see Bill Buckley lighting up like a Christmas tree at Michael Davies' comments. I really recommend you watch that entire video. You can see that in his heart he was a traditionalist, but this revolution in the church, the craziness, the silly season, everything just kept going and going until guys like Buckley just threw up their hands and walked away. And you know what? I think there are a lot more than we think, and maybe, you know, there but for the grace of God go all of us when you consider the, the length and breadth of this modernist revolution in the church. It was a disaster. And at this point, thinking about how Buckley reacted to, the, reacted to the new mass, I really don't know anyone personally anymore who doesn't feel pretty much the same way about the new mass. And it's gotten a lot worse now than it was then. Most of my friends don't even attend the thing, of course, but among those who do still attend it, they're all just, yeah, they're just tired of it. It doesn't do anything for them. Uh, you know, the, 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 in, the way it is said in most parishes now, certainly, I want to be careful not to choose my words. I don't, you know, I, there's, there are certainly some priests who are saying the new mass are doing their best. They're saying it in Latin. They're doing it in Orientum. I'm not talking about them. But the way you see it in most parishes, it's just so stale. It's old. It's hackneyed. It's sort of hippie-esque. It's passe. And the only people who really seem to be into it are, you know, the gay electors named Perry and, and the old ladies who like to hand out the, the Eucharist. Everybody else is bored to death if they're bothering to even go. And they walk out Sunday after Sunday. You know, resenting the fact that this silly thing, this service, just cut into the football game that day. It's just not, it's not doing anything. And this is why Catholics, especially men, have gotten bored, they're tired of it, they've lost their Catholic identity, they've moved away from it. And then when you walk into a new mass, it's like a, you know, it's like a junior high talent show. People running around singing and strumming guitars and doing all this nonsense like Buckley was talking about 40 years ago. And it's left the Catholic world, the serious Catholics, it's just kind of left them disillusioned. <laughs> and really, it's only thanks, thanks to Pope Francis now, who obviously has completely jumped the shark, that people are finally beginning to wake up. You're finally beginning to see that the church has been taken over by a modernist coup. And it's, it's happened a long time before the Second Vatican Council. Yes, we've admitted, we've admitted that many times. But the reality is that coup came out of the closet, if you will, at the second time of the Second Vatican Council. There's no doubt about that. So things are changing now. In, the, in a large measure, it's because of Pope Francis. I don't think it's necessarily entirely fair because Pope Francis was always inevitable. But now the things that are happening in the Vatican have neo-Catholics, quote-unquote, uh, conservative Catholics, folks that aren't traditionalists, they're scratching their head and they're saying, what the heck? What is going on in the Vatican? And I think that's the, that's the silver lining. That's the good sign this Christmas. People are waking up. I mean, for example, who would have ever thought, even just 10 years ago, that we would be preparing now, gearing up for the next Chartres pilgrimage over in France, the 70-mile walking pilgrimage from Paris to Chartres, that we would be gearing up for that next May, coming up this coming May, and that the celebrant, in one of the most famous, obviously, cathedrals in all of Europe, that that celebrant would be none other than a curial cardinal the prefect for the Congregation of Divine Worship and the Discipline of Sacraments, one Cardinal Robert Serra. And yet that's what's happening, and we just got the news this week. Cardinal Serra is going to be offering a solemn high, pontifical, traditional, obviously, Latin Mass at Chartres for 15,000 pilgrims, and then, of course, that'll be broadcast live streaming all over the world. It's a huge statement. Now, this is the same Cardinal Serra, by the way, who Pope Francis took to task recently, recently actually corrected him, because the Cardinal had tried to sort of rein in the Pope's liturgical de decentralization uh, agenda. Check this out if you've forgotten what that one is. Take a look. Pope Francis issues a public correction to the prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship. The Vatican released the letter on Sunday to Cardinal Robert Serra. 
Edward Penton, Rome correspondent for EWTN's National Catholic Register, joins us. Ed, it is quite unprecedented for the Pope to write a letter like this to one of his cardinals. How did this come about? Well, it goes back, Lauren, to uh, the Pope's uh, motu proprio papal decree, which he issued last month called Magnum Principium, in which he uh, authorized uh, the translations of liturgical texts from the Latin uh, to be given uh, for bishops' conferences to be given more authority to, to do that. Um, but Cardinal Serra uh, believes that authority should be kept with the Vatican because Latin is seen as very much a, a language of unity and he wants to keep those translations as being as faithful to the, to the Latin as possible. How do you see this playing out? You've covered the Vatican for a very long time. Will Cardinal Serra be able to stay in his position given this clear disagreement between him and the Pope over the liturgy? So we're going to have to see just how they work this out, whether Cardinal Serra remains in post or whether he chooses to resign or perhaps uh, the Holy Father tries to find a replacement. Yeah, so we can, we can see where that's going. And now Cardinal Serra is off to chart to offer, without question, the most public, high-profile, traditional Latin Mass in 2018. Now let's just talk Turkey for a minute. I understand what people are thinking already. Cardinal Serra, well... He's not a traditionalist, uh, you know, he has some problems, even though he's very conservative. Sure, I get that. A lot of people, including myself, would like to see men such as Cardinal Sarah, much, uh, such as Cardinal Burke, uh, denounce the Second Vatican Council and, and the new Mass as total failures, which I believe they, 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 they have been, they've been proven to be. But for just, for the moment, for tonight, for the purposes of this conversation, let's Let's look at this. Let's look at Cardinal Serra offering the traditional Latin Mass in this high-profile way. Let's look at it from the point of view, not of the, of the traditionalists, not of us, but rather from the point of view of the modernists, the liberals, the folks who are in charge, the revolutionaries, you know, your Cardinal Caspers, your Pope Francis, and so forth. Men who spent their entire lives throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, at tradition, at the old Mass. Let's just take a look at it from their point of view. Because all of a sudden, when they see these things happening, they're obviously beginning to realize that things didn't quite work out the way they had planned. And here's where I think all traditional Catholics can rejoice at what, what's happening. And again, we'd love it to go a lot further. We'd love Cardinal Sarah to come out tomorrow and say, the new Mass, ah, it's a disaster. We're all going, but he hasn't done that yet. But still, tens of thousands, even millions of Catholics are beginning to wake up. They're beginning to move back in the direction of holy tradition and when they see something like a Cardinal Sarah offering the traditional Latin Mass, making the statements that he is against the, you know, the advance, the further deconstruction of the new Mass, this means something. This means a lot. And it sends a very strong signal. Like I've said so many times down here, these Cardinals are not bloggers. They don't get to just shoot off like I can whenever they want. But these little, what we might call, ah, it's just a, just a drop in the bucket, not a big deal. In the land of the Vatican, in that crazy land of Oz, in the Vatican, Eternal City, Little things like this are not little at all. They're huge, and they have ramifications, and they have, they have a ripple effect all throughout the church, and they know it in the Vatican. You know, even high-ranking cardinals now are giving their blessing to this traditional Catholic mass movement, this, this de facto Catholic restoration movement, because they know, men like Cardinal Sarah know instinctively, that something's really gone wrong in the church today. Something has gone terribly wrong. Yes, from our point of view, Cardinal Sarah's not doing everything we want. Of course. Of course not. We'd like to see him do a lot more. But when he's doing it to the extent that he is going back in the direction of tradition, trying to restore some sanity, we need to look at that and say, yes, from the modernist point of view, that's devastating. That's why there's always this rumor that Cardinal Sarah's going to be, you know, he's next. His head's on the chopping block. He's next to be sort of kicked out and to try to find a Cardinal Flupich replacement for a Cardinal Sarah. That's, that's what the, the name of the game is these days. So some of these really, really conservative cardinals, yeah, they still think Vatican II can be patched back together, or they say that they do, maybe because they don't know what the alternative is, but they say these things, and it kind of makes us wince a little bit. Pope Benedict XVI, his entire pontificate proved that the elusive <laughs> hermeneutic of continuity between tradition and the council, it's like the missing link in the evolution fairy tale. It just doesn't exist. And without it, without that continuity, the whole thing, the whole Second Vatican Council revolution fall, comes crashing down. They say, we must find a way to interpret Vatican II in light of tradition. This is actually a very interesting statement. We, you and I don't think it can be interpreted that way. But the fact that they think they need to find a way to interpret it that way is interesting. And as traditional Catholics, we need to get a little smart and listen to this a little bit. Think about what it means. 
This is something we never used to hear back in the day. I remember you never heard a cardinal or a bishop suggest there was something wrong. You needed to find the hermeneutic of continuity and all that. Why are they saying that? Because they know that the council, the spirit of the council has taken the church in a direction no one recognizes anymore. And they're trying to put it back together. Now we all want them to admit that it can't be put back together, that it can't be fixed, that it was wrong from the start. Of course, we all want that. I want that. But at least, at least these men can finally see, and much more importantly, can finally admit that something is broken and desperately in need of, of repair in the church. And that five years from now, I'm convinced half of these men that we're talking, most of these men that we're talking about, the one that are, ones that are really waking up now, are going to realize it can't be fixed. And they're going to drop all this into the ash bin of history exactly where it belongs. So what, are, what, is this, what does this all mean for us? These quote-unquote little things that are happening with high-ranking churchmen in the direction or in favor of tradition. What does it mean for us now in 2017? It means that the revolution, the revolution was so almighty triumphant 25, 30 years ago, they won absolutely everything was done. The old mass was abrogated. The new mass was here to stay. Tradition was outlawed. Remember all that? Well, it means that revolution, somewhere along the line, took one in the back. And now it's getting weak. You see, it's getting, and that's hard to see right now, but we can, we can tell from these signs that something is changing, that the revolution is beginning to fade. It's beginning to sputter. It's beginning to wear out. You know, I talk to diocesan priests all the time, every week, who are learning to say the old mass, who already have, who are saying it in secret, you know, and they're, they're, they're tired of playing the Pollyanna glad game. And I wish I could give you their names. I wish I could show you who they are. Because I know some people out there, some traditionalists, don't believe they exist. These guys are all over the place. And they're doing great work, sort of covertly, under, 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 the, uh, under the wire, behind the scenes. This is why I stay confident that not all is lost in the Novus Order, because I know a lot of these priests. And they're getting stronger and more numerous all the time. And in a few months, I'll be leading 50 Americans into one of the greatest cathedrals in Europe. This massive, spectacular event. News all over the place. There's an airplanes above taking pictures of this huge demonstration of, you know, of traditional Catholicism. Movers and shakers in the church and in government filling the pews, packing that cathedral together with 15,000 traditional Catholics from all over the world. And what are they there for? To witness a Vatican cardinal offer the very thing that the whole and entire Catholic world said was dead, gone, buried, outlawed, and abrogated, never to return 40 years ago. Namely, the traditional Latin Mass. It's back. So Merry Christmas, friends, friends of the underground, friends of Remnant TV. Thank you so much for your support. Keep the old faith. Stay tuned. This thing is far from over. But in the meantime, this week, Christ is born. He is king. Christ is king. We're still here, and the old mass is coming back with a vengeance, and so is the old faith. And the old revolutionaries, old and feeble, are beginning to sense that it didn't all go their way. Praise God for that. I'm Michael Matt for the Remnant Underground. Thank you for watching tonight. Merry Christmas, and we'll see you next time.